Welcome to Thrive at Work, a podcast which offers insights and latest employment trends to help employers attract, retain and develop great people with me, Polly Rathbone Ward. With special guests, we're going to be discussing the many and varied aspects of HR, from practical topics to overarching cultural themes. We'll be looking beyond traditional styles of management to bring new and people-centred ideas to forward-thinking organisations that want to shape a new future where people can thrive at work. Hello and welcome to Thrive at Work. Today's discussion focuses on ethical and responsible business practices. Socially responsible business practices refer to corporate activities whose main purpose is to benefit individuals, the community or the environment. At a time when competition for talent is tight, gaining the reputation of a kind and caring organisation can help an employer differentiate themselves. I'm so pleased to be joined today by my guest, Joe Lord, founder of Bayern, which helps businesses to make meaningful change by focusing on people, planet and profit with purpose. And I've borrowed that from Joe's website. <laughs> um, Joe, welcome. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Polly. Um, to start with, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just talking us through your background and how you've come to do what you're doing today. Yeah, um, so I'm an ex-finance manager um, for over 20 years. I've helped um, mainly small to medium-sized businesses. Um, and as I had finance in my role, I quite often then would look after people's salaries, which therefore meant that I also had employer well-being, um, performance reviews, sort of way days. And then from the supplier side I was very much about having a fair price policy and and over time um, every sort of two to three years I would sort of change employer kind of feeling I'd done enough and it was time to move on and and then I went to Glastonbury in 2019 and I got given a tote bag that said if not you who if not now when and all and all the time I was there I was thinking what can I do with my skills what could I do to sort of improve my input um, and my impact and I thought actually I could bring it all together and I could go into small um, businesses and I sort of up to 50 employees is sort of my client base um, and bring all that knowledge skills training and and support them make their impact more positive um, potentially moving away from just looking at profit and shareholder um, to more stakeholder um, and uh, balance their people, planet and profit on their bottom line. Brilliant. And so what services do you actually offer to clients? Um, So it's fairly bespoke, depending on where they are in their journey. And I did use the word journey probably too many times, but um, (laughs) basically we start with a free introductory session. um, So I can see what they're up to, where they want to go, um, what their aspirations are. Um, so basically, and also what their in-house resources are, because you know, sometimes even especially in a small company, everybody's you know, fully full capacity, who's got the time to do um, the tasks. So, um, and that's partly when I discovered um, the impact assessment that B Corp um, provide free, um, and there will be a link later. Um, but basically it's a really, really helpful framework and it gets clients to look at governance, um, workers and it's called workers not employees because any freelancer working more than 20 hours needs to be considered in the calculations um, then you've got community which is your suppliers as well as your locality environment and finally customers and that and as it goes through the questions it really does make you think and I get lots of eureka moments of kind of we could be doing that well, we do that already, but we don't write it down. So it kind of, so so the service I offer is that sort of tool, that guidance to kind of, um, and then it's not necessarily suitable for everyone. There are other accreditations which are available. Also, sometimes it is literally, you know, a company has been asked for an ESG report in order to put together a bid, mm-hmm. um, environmental social governance, and they just, where do I start? How do I put that together? And it's... Um, so, and finally, um, and there's an impact report. So once a year, um, a lot of companies, you know, put down their positive, you know, what they've done that year. So whether they've done anything in the community, whether they've volunteered, um, 
and I help with the copy and just collating that. So I am sort of jack of all trades in the world of social <laughs> and environmental <laughs> purpose. Brilliant. And the impact assessment tool, did you call it from B Corp? Yeah. So do organisations use that to sort of see where they're at at the moment and where they could be improving, yeah. making small change or in the right direction? So um, the basically over 150,000 companies to date, um, well, when I checked on the website yesterday, <laughs> had, uh, <laughs> had used it, um, of which for just under 5,000 accredited. So a lot of people are using it as a tool to sort of like a handrail to kind of guide mm. them mm. to where they need to be. Um, and sometimes it's that whole thing about, you know, oh, we're only a small company, we don't need policies. Um, but the impact assessment sort of highlights how fairness works when you've got it written down. Mm. And sometimes it is just that kind of like, oh, OK, that now makes sense. And it's not that people haven't thought about it. It's just they mm. haven't had the time or even, um, you know, just how much easier it is if it is written down that everybody knows exactly where they stand, um, which was not only saves time, can be empowering. Um, um, so, yeah, yeah so um, it is a really useful tool, um, as I say. And, I mean, a lot of my clients go on it originally initially to sort of see where they are and then they start to sort of get aspirational and start to see the points that B Corp aligned to the answers and then kind of go actually we could become B Corp certified mm. 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 <laughs> um, and then and that and then of course like all accreditations it basically means that if you know if you can look at them instantly and know that across five levels they are trying to do business better um, and you know some and a third party has verified a lot of their practices. Mm -hmm. And why do you think an organisation should perhaps go for B Corp? What are the benefits and what is, what's it all about and what does it give you as a business? Oh, so basically, um, it, from the outside, obviously, it gives instant recognition, you know, let's say this third party accreditation mm -hmm. um, that you, you are um, trying to be an ethical business and you have looked at all across five areas of your business um, at the moment you have to get 80 points plus to get the accreditation um, and that can be scored in different boxes so you could be particularly good with your environmental impact but maybe not treating your workers that great mm. so, but B Corp are always always um, re-evaluating and they found these weaknesses and they are going to strengthen it so, so it will become that accreditation will become stronger each you know each cycle mm. um and so i think from that perspective instant you know marketing value um i've worked with a number of cus customers who um are recruiting and when they mm -hmm. they say you know oh you're going for b corp or you're a b corp they light up they get more engaged um because they know that they're then potentially starting working with somebody who has values that you know they will, will align with. So, mm. um, so in that respect, I think you know it's it's a great sort of stamp. Um, so basically, B Corp themselves um, did some research um, and are looking at small businesses against their peer, how they perform against their peers. Mm -hmm. So they're faster growing in turnover and employer headcount and have higher expectations about future growth. They have greater levels of employee retention, engagement and diversity, more robust government processes, higher levels of innovation and a greater focus on civil and community engagement. And I'll, yeah, and I'll put the link to that research a summary for you. But yeah, so mm. yeah, from what I see myself and the research that B Corp have done, it's, uh, there's a lot to be gained from Absolutely, that's really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, so I was interested in um, what, how you talk about um, people, planet and profit with purpose. So um, talk to us more about that. Tell us about the sort of relationship between those, those things. So uh, basically, I am, I'm a great believer in everything that's connected. Um, so people, planet, profit, so if you're no longer, if you're a for-profit company and you're, you stop making a profit, um, there's a potential that you then have to lay, let go of some of your people. So obviously it's important to 
you know, that that balance is going on. Um, however, you know, you also don't want to make profit over, you know, not getting rid of hazardous materials um, appropriately. So nobody wants to work for a company that's throwing waste down a sink that's going to do damage. So mm. it is, so to me, they're all into what, into, intertwined. Um, and that's why, you know, in my job, um, you know, my company business of buy-in, it's you know, balanced is the B um, because it is all about, you know, if you do a Venn diagram, you know, how you treat people, how you treat the planet, you know, how you, you know, how you make that profit, you know, you know, have you checked your supply chain, you know, can, is the transparency in it, are you happy with who supplies your product that you then sell, you know, it's all intertwined. And I think for me, that's sort of why I say that whole look across the whole business, um, as opposed to, I'm not, I'm not saying don't start by looking in one area, you know, you know, sometimes people come to me and they just want to measure their environmental footprint, great start, you know, um, but over time, if you can sort of spread it across the whole business and get that balance, um, mm. that's what it's. <clears throat> yeah, I was really interested before we press record, I actually asked you what the, um, what the reason for your business name is. And I hadn't realised, actually, Joe, I've known you for a little while, but it still came <laughs> as a surprise. I wasn't sure. So do you want to tell that story? Um, yeah. So when I put together um, by and I am um, I kind of come up with a name and I'm a great believer in um, energy being something that not only do we consume, but also we, ex we give out. And so it was sort of on the environmental side, you know, it's your energy used and how that converts into the carbon footprint from a human side, you know, energy within you, your personality, your life force is an energy, um, the two intermingle. Um, and then that again, that's that whole balance. So buy-in stood for balance your energy now, um, mm -hmm. because it was the bringing together of all parties. And um, now, because, you know, I say there is no time like mm -hmm. the present to, mm -hmm. to be making these changes. Mm, brilliant. Thank you. Um, what a great thing to do with your business. It's just amazing. And, you know, we, we need to do more. We know that for the environment um, and you encouraging all these businesses to go down this route is, is just such a brilliant thing. So <clears throat> what does sustainability in business mean to you? So I think sustainability has been a little bit hijacked by the environmental mm. um, sense of it um and obviously to sustain to maintain you know i think in business it is to keep going because if you you've got to stay in business to have a voice yeah. <laughs> so you know and it is to then have that responsibility for that momentum of that so it's bringing it is considering the environment but it is also equally if not more um considering the social impact because obviously you know it's the people that will be looking after the planet. Mm. So, um, yeah, so sustainability to me is, is, is that balance, is that sort of responsibility of all elements um, to, to, to maintain. Yeah, and I think, you know, being sustainable in a business means that you have to um, at least break even in order to keep going, if not making a profit. Otherwise, yeah. it is literally not sustainable. I think that's how you've, yes. you've described it to me before. So it <laughs> makes a yeah, lot of sense. Definitely. And as you say, it's been hijacked a little bit with the environmental angle. But um, just to make that basic point, I guess, you know, for, for a business to actually be sustainable means something else as well, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> great. Thank you. Um, so how, in what ways can an organisation improve their socially responsible business practices? Oh, um, so from the environmental side, um, there are a lot of companies out there that have tools that help you measure your, your energy consumption and convert it into your carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it, it really does depend on, on your business. Um, you know, whether you've got a low environmental impact or whether you're in manufacturing as to which of those tools will be beneficial for you. Mm. Um, but I think really that's one of the first point places to start off is actually capturing the data in order to be able to measure it. Because once you know what you're consuming, that's when you can start to see what you can potentially not, energy you can get away without using, things you can reduce, equipment that you can improve. 
um, from a from a day to day personal employee view, you know, it's things like remove remove the end of the desk bin. You know, that every time somebody has to throw something away, they have to leave their desk. And that's good for obviously the physically moving, good for your well-being. You're not just sitting there all day. But also as you go to the bin and decide which you know box it goes into, you're also educating your brain to then go home and also think about it. So it sort of carries on. It makes mm -hmm. you as the employer be able to recycle easier and it kind of um, spreads into everyday life. So there's those sort of different levels of either kind of as a um, infrastructure to to um, just daily habits really on that side of it and on the um, sort of social side it is just things like checking in um, uh, engagement and satisfaction surveys um, I think sometimes I mean I worked with a lovely client and we took one and he was quite disappointed to discover that you know they were everybody wasn't 100% satisfied um, but things like they didn't even know the company mission um, and it is just sort of by well, checking in on that and then obviously they then had a workshop and they all together decided on the company mission and um, four months later when we did that survey again you know 100% across all questions he'd taken his whole team on the journey with him so yeah there's so there's lots of different ways of kind of bringing um, you know, social and environmental mm, considerations that's a, into your business. That's a really interesting example, isn't it? That, um, you know, feedback, whilst it might be a bit, um, a bit abrupt sometimes when you initially get it, can be a really good thing because you are getting information and how can you improve mm. unless you know what the current st status is and then you can sort of work towards improving that. And the fact that he then went through that process with the team, um, so he wasn't just coming up with the mission statement on his own and then just imparting that information to them. They actually did that as a team effort. Um, helps to bring people sort of together, doesn't it? And it helps to bring people on the, the mission with you and engage them and motivate them. And also I think it develops a kind of common language between certain people. And if you keep on, so the next stage, I guess then, is whenever you have a company meeting or company briefing or overview or whatever, the team meetings, to then use that language and reiterate it and repeat it so that you are then um, reinforcing that message. And it's not just a a mission for the sake of it it's something that you do carry on using and it's very important to the very life soul of the business yeah yeah, yeah great super thank you we've talked about b corp a little bit um what other bodies or um organizations are there or accreditations that people might be interested in looking up um just as an alternative to b corp or whatever else is out there Sure. Well, there's quite a few, um, and yeah. so um, I'll mention um, a few that I know and have, have worked with. So there's a the Good Business Charter, and I particularly like the Good Business Charter because it's also open to charities, um, so obviously not for profits as well as for profits, um, and it has it's a self accreditation, but it's over ten areas of business, um, and they are. Some of them are quite linked to the UN principles of business as well. So it's that whole kind of pay a fair wage or pay a living wage, mm -hmm. um, have some environmental responsibility. Um, th these guy business ethics about paying fair tax, um, paying your suppliers on time. Um, you know, and um, so you kind of go through those 10 points and as long as you're doing them, you can say yes, you do, and then you'll get the good business charge accreditation. And what, and again, so companies like Deloitte are members of it. I'm a member of it. Um, uh, the charities. Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, Neighbourly is also a B Corp, so there's B Corps are part of it, and it's very very reasonable. Um, it's free for the first year, so it's a nice accreditation to have to sort of say, you know, we've looked across again. All these areas of business and yes we can say we do these 10 things um other ones obviously the living you know becoming a living wage member um so you can sign up and actually get the the mark for your for your uh, marketing that says i you know we pay everybody the minimum of a living wage so then there's also investors in people 
which has been around quite a long time. Mm. Um, I think longer than B Corp or some of the others. Um, and that's specifically looking at, you know, and then they have investors in wellbeing as well. Okay. Um, great places to work, mindful employee, Bristol Women in Business Charter, disability confident. Um, there's you know, business against poverty. There's lots and lots of different memberships. Um, and on the on the environmental side, I quite like the city, um, the surfers, um, city two two fifty, and that's where you sort of you pay two fifty a year, um, and uh, that money goes towards cleaning the sea. Um, so, oh, wow. so it's just sort of so some of them are just memberships that you can join, but it just mm. shows that you are you know supporting other companies and, and charities so mm. um, yeah and the 10 un points that you mentioned before they are big global issues aren't they i remember looking at them once and there's one about clean water you know cleaner seas um you know because this is a big issue that affects us all and you know it'd be great if we could all do something small to contribute to, but the, you know it's not something that one business is going to solve ever for, you know Ever at all but it's something if we all do if we all contribute a little bit we can make a big difference I think they're quite interesting aren't they it's things like gender equality cleaner seas if I remember I can't quite remember the others but yes yeah there's yeah, so yeah so 17 um, they're the UN development social development goals um, oh, okay 17 goals 169 targets wow um, <laughs> Um, unfortunately, we're only eight years away from that 2030 deadline of, or goal. Um, so, yeah, and actually everything you do in business, it's, um, it's well, not everything, but a lot of things you do in business are actually connected to those. Mm. Um, you know, so, for instance, like, you know, having um, a female director on your board, you know, that's helping towards gender equality. Mm. Um, having an intern um, or work placement program from a school that's specific that's set in a low income area. You know that's better education. That's mm. um, so. There's lots of things that you can do, as I say, on a day-to-day -day level that will be impacting those goals. But sometimes they feel quite small. But you know, they all build up and they all account. Um, Absolutely. For it, um, the ten principles of the UN Global Compact is more sort of again that whole kind of similar to the Good Business Charter. It's how you. Um, how you work and that very much looks at human rights labor anti-corruption i see in right. your workplace so so it sort of again does cross into the goals but it's sort of more principles rather than um, mm. yeah and then all of these things even if they seem small you know will have a huge impact on your ability to attract people and retain people because I think people, particularly since the pandemic, have had time to think and reflect, you know, on their lives and about what they want to accomplish with their lives and how they want to spend their time. And so a business that is not, um, you know, doing some of these things will not be a preferred option of employer anymore. So it does make business sense as well, doesn't it, to go down this, this sort of route and look at where you can make small change. Absolutely. And um, I think, again, sort of, um, so I've changed my articles at Companies House to say that I will consider the social and environmental impact of, of all my decisions. Um, and within that, I also say that I'll do an impact report. Now this is, you don't have to be a B Corp to change your articles, but it is a requirement of, of B Corp. So there's lots and lots of impact reports suddenly kind of appearing on people's websites and through LinkedIn. Um, and a lot of those, are then connecting what they've done to the um, global goals. Um, and so it's really nice to see, um, yeah, as I said earlier, that whole kind of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day in business is making that impact. Or for instance, they then decide that their charity of choice will be you know, clean water. So they will mm. go and do a, a litter pick as a, as a team. Um, and then, and so it's a it's a win win. It's a great team building exercise. Mm -hmm. You're doing something for the environment. You're adding to the goals, and um, and your purpose of, of of being as a company and as a person is interlinked. And uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, so there's lots of ways that they all feed mm -hmm. in. But brilliant. And do you see some organisations giving um, giving their people a day or two a year to do some charity work or something like that? Is that something you've seen? Yeah, I've seen more um, companies moving towards, and again, a mixture of having a day, so, and a collective day where they've all agreed what they're 
mm. you know, like to do. Mm-hmm. Um, if they can't agree, um, again, it's that whole thing of, um, you know, if you take somebody down the road that they don't, they're not comfortable going on, then uh, it's missed its point. So sometimes if the team can't agree, that then actually just letting them have a volunteer day in a charity or, you know, that of their choosing. So I've seen um, an act that actively encourage, you know, go listen to your workforce and go with the model that fits best. Um, mm. yeah. um, and again, that whole kind of, you know, does it make sense as well for the business to have everybody off on one day or is it better that you know Mm. they all go off separately so it's fitting it in but yeah more and more um I see lots of discounts I see pro bono work um I see revenue um percentages given away and um match funding of um activities with Mm. uh, with employees um but yeah that volunteering is definitely turning up more and more and You've probably got lots of, you know, you've probably worked with lots of businesses in this way, but um, I just wondered if you had at all any sort of um, um, information about the difference that this might make. So have you been with an organisation on their on their journey of making these changes and have you seen any difference in terms of engagement or motivation or teamwork or um, uh, retention of staff? Is there anything you can tell us about that? Um. It's always very difficult to know sometimes. I mean, we were talking about inflation um, with a, client, uh, a couple of clients and um, and the slight gulp of how high it was going to run this year, but mm-hmm. actually made the decision that he was going to um, give everybody an, an inflationary pay rise, and which I really liked. However, I did say there's no way now of knowing if that's retained your staff because you know, we don't know who may have been thinking of leaving. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> so it's sometimes quite hard <laughs> to quantify the kind of a good action. And I think that was a brilliant action to kind of say, you know, it's going to be lean out there. I'm going to give you, you know, this this um, higher than usual um, pay rise. Um, not, you know, and it, not linked to performance. This was just, you know, mm. inflationary one. Um, so, yeah, so I haven't, um, <laughs> you know, I haven't necessarily seen historically you know I, I haven't worked for any companies that has a really high turnover mm. to sort of see um but I've definitely um heard and um been told by as I go into companies just sort of happy you know there's definitely the culture um shift yeah. has, has changed so um yeah. but no I haven't got any stats for long enough to sort of yeah prove and it is to say some of it's quite hard to quantify isn't it how can you prove that what you've done has necessarily stopped yes <laughs> uh, I guess if you can't you know if you haven't got the turnover from the year before to measure against or it's not a large enough organization to yeah. for, that to, for that to really matter um but it will be things like um you know engagement and productivity you know are people actually because engagement increases productivity and um sickness absence and uh, i mean reduces sickness absence and um hopefully decreases return um attrition so um and you might find that the culture is more open as well so if people are thinking of leaving i mean you very rarely you never get turnover of not percent because yeah. that happens people might move away or they might have a career change or they might you know things other things happen so you're, you're unlikely to get no percent turnover anyway but um you know they might find that their recruitment budget actually has decreased or they're not using it all because they don't they're not needing to recruit anymore um but yeah it's those sort of hidden costs um but um yeah interesting yeah. cool thank you That's right. but also i just think on the um linking in you know the the fifth wheel of it, all of, of of customers um i do think that again you know that retainment that coming back if you, you know if your workforce is happier it comes across doesn't it i mean we all we've all spoken to um a service provider where they you know where you can feel the positivity um yeah. and then the service provider where really you know you sort of want to come off the phone and let them go make a cup of tea <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and I, so i think you know and um and i think so again you know having that positive workforce it does it, you mm. know I think it, mm. it, 
it's giving it, it feeds into all areas of business and I think mm -hmm. to say it's hard necessarily to quantify always but I think a happier if you're happier in your work it definitely comes out doesn't it yes absolutely and things like those team events as well like perhaps you could do a fitness challenge all together or you could do a you know a run all together fundraising for charity or something and you know which then feeds into the well-being agenda as well and if you you know you put these sorts of things on the website and social media and then you're building that employer brand as well so that mm -hmm you know, people want to come and work for you rather than you having to really start from scratch when you have a vacancy. Yeah. Um, people, you know, you've already made a reputation for yourself out there in the marketplace. So just making things easier for yourself as well. Yeah. I'm interested, Joe, because I know you work with a lot of smaller organisations that don't necessarily have HR. So I just wondered where this sits in the business that you're perhaps work. I mean, is it just with the CEO or how do they, how do people tend to organise themselves? or how do you advise you know who then who tends to drive this from inside the organization so um under 10 employees seems to primarily be the founder mm -hmm. um quite often oh, i'd say not quite often sometimes with an employee having sort of mentioned they'd like to work towards something um and um and then it's about yeah and then they will bring on you know a manager um or two um i mean as you say lots of companies especially of that size are outsourcing not only human resources but also the accountancy side um mm. and um so lots of information that was quite useful so that about being able to measure stuff um and um do those engagement and satisfaction surveys and um, are outsourced so it's sort of making sure that there is a connection in um, and so it's bringing some tools in to the founder um, and again the software out there even it can even just be a you know a piece of paper you know <laughs> put it in an envelope and shred it afterwards it doesn't always have to be high tech <laughs> but it is sort of remembering that just because you've outsourced them you should necessarily you know bring in some of those um, areas and then on a slightly bigger so once you sort of go past 10 you quite often then will have maybe a part-time um, accountant or a part-time um, people manager um, and then there tends to be a little team um, and so sort of two or three people mm. working together and coming together and uh, aligning different tasks so mm. um, it is just sort of you know when you don't have the in-house capabilities it's actually just and it's almost trying to align uh, a light the um fire in your employees so there's usually somebody that cares a little bit more about the environment than mm -hmm. others and they may be able to sort of be the ambassador for sort of you know capturing that data or trying to or looking for an, an offset project or reducing their impact and the same on the mm -hmm. social side you know somebody who's very who, who likes to organize events they might, and it's not necessarily their job title, but they might step up and say, mm -hmm. you know, I'd like to organise this. So it's sort of trying to um, bring everybody along if it's a small mm -hmm. team and sort of mm -hmm. get, see what lights up, what what doesn't feel like, you know, you don't want to give it all to one person. You don't want to say, oh, we need to start minuting our meetings so we can sort of see how we improve. You know, <laughs> a, a, you know, you could be the person that takes the minutes. It's like, no, <laughs> everybody can take it in turns makes absolute sense to have a record of what you've agreed but you know let's sort of make it fair and let's try and give the jobs to people who actually want them mm. yeah that creates a nice little work stream doesn't mm. it really yeah great okay and you talked about engagement and satisfaction surveys is there a particular one that you would recommend or that you use or um i haven't um i, I don't know if you have um um have basically use various things <laughs> I haven't, nothing's jumped out at me as yet so um yeah so any that you uh, um well I've sort of developed one actually oh. uh, <laughs> I use with my um clients which is quite just a handy sort of audit yeah. um you know to get started really but yeah I just wondered if you also Gallup is a good one for engagement um Gallup is a, a huge organization that um of research across the world really with lots and lots of different organizations and thousands of employees and they did a big piece of research into what makes a great 
um, you know, a really positive place to work. And they came up with 12 common statements. Um, now, this is regardless of the size of organisation. So some might be tiny, some might be huge. These 12 statements were common statements. Um, and it's things like, um, you know, I have a best friend at work. Um, someone has spoken to me about my career development in the last six months. It's things like that, but um, and which can give you a, it's a bit of, it's quite, you know, basic, but it's a good one to just look at and think, um, right, you know, what am I doing to encourage or facilitate or enable people to have these things um, to sort of, you know, work your way through and tick the boxes really. But um, yeah, great, thank you. Um, so are there any challenges that you see clients come across when they're sort of implementing this sort of change? I imagine it's a very lovely and positive thing to do, but I just wondered if there were any challenges that you've come across or that your clients come across. Um, yeah, so I mean, one of the biggest challenges, especially for a small business that has already, you know, everybody has a task um, mm. and a say, especially those who have outsourced all the um, extra um sort of operational side of it mm -hmm. is is who's going to do it and um and how's it going to be maintained you right. know so so i can come in and um you know provide that framework provide that to-do list even do some of the um groundwork to sort of mm. but i you know i always want to leave a company able to keep going there's no point sort of you know so getting them on accreditation and then just wanting it all fall apart or mm -hmm. or just bringing in some better practices um mm -hmm. that last 10 minutes because it doesn't isn't going to work so it is all about bringing in that um is maintaining it and so as a that's probably one of the hardest is is deciding who can do what without it being a burden you know bringing in the joy and the reasoning behind it going for their strengths um and what they would like to do um, and potentially having to outsource some bits you know to support the initiatives mm -hmm. um, which again is obviously financial you know an extra, an extra cost so um, it's yeah so time um, and resources are probably the two um, biggest things but as again because it's a change it's that whole kind of thing of you know well, this isn't what I normally do, or this isn't what how we normally do it and stuff. But if you can grow with the change, if you can bring everybody along with it, I think then it becomes just part of every day. So mm. it's definitely worth going with it, running with it. I do find um, sometimes people, you know, get so far down and, and, and then it's like, oh, but we've got really busy. So it is just kind of, you know, keeping it as a priority, this, this you know, your, your positive impact it kind of needs to be at the core um, of all your decisions yeah. and not kind of, oh, let's just pop it away again while, because we've got a bit busy. And I think that's, yeah. Yeah, I think, as you said before, I guess it's about developing those daily habits so that it doesn't feel like a chore or a task. It's just part of what we do here. It's just, you know, this is what we do with the recycling. This is what we do. Yeah. This. this is, you know, we always check our suppliers for this, that and the other. Um, and it becomes part of the whole ethos and methodology. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I can well imagine that things might yeah. get a bit busy and it gets sort of pushed to the sidelines as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, Building on that then, I guess, um, you know, in, embedding those daily habits and pre more practical sort of tips. Just going back to, I know we weren't necessarily talking about climate change, but the impact of climate change is widely reported. And I think, you know, though, you know, we're all doing things in our individual homes to hopefully help and do what we can. But if an employer would like to do more about this, what, what are some sort of practical tips that you would suggest um, that uh, could make a difference. So I would look at my supply chain and potentially um, have you know the supplier miles and see if 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 and who or from what you could buy from say within a 50 mile radius um, and then potentially even even tighter. Um, that thought of, you know, where is actually the end destination? So it might actually not even be that a local supplier to you, that it's actually better to be buying from a local supplier to your customer. So it's just sort of keeping, you know, supplier miles in, in place. Um, it's the whole fair price thing again. If, if it's cheap, there's a reason it's cheap. And it might not be just the 
environmental impact it might be the you know the wages of of, of who made it but it, it there's there's you know there's a reason why it's not a fair price and so get to know the market rates of what you know you should be paying um and it might be a glut of stock you know fair enough take advantage of it but you know do just always just sort of question you know um and again on that whole questioning oh yeah how transparent is that supply chain you know how you know are they are, what are they doing um can you see you know if they're doing any improvements do they have um an impact report or are they prepared to sh share their code of ethics or have they asked you to sign a code of conduct or you sign a code of conduct to sort of um that you are doing everything in your power to reduce um your your impact so it's so on so i think on that side of it is you know that supplier transparency is is mm -hmm. is fairly key even for small businesses to just as you, and as we said earlier you know it's oh but we always use you know x you know i haven't got time to sort of you know only big companies do a proper procurement process or whatever mm -hmm. it's like but if you find the time now it'll be worth it later it's just trying to get say that mindset yeah, it's prioritising it, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. If people would like to get in touch with you, Joe, to continue the conversation, how's the what's the best way to get in touch with you? Um, so I'm on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. and I've also um you can also contact me through um the website uh, www.byon.co.uk. Um, Brilliant. So that's byen.co.uk. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. We're coming towards the end of our time. Did you have any final thoughts, anything you'd like to say just, just before we finish? Um, just that it is really, it is really worth it. One of the best things I've ever done is transfer um, pivot is a keyword into this area because <laughs> now I just work with a really positive, proactive people who are trying to to improve their impact and even if you say it doesn't you don't have to start big you know it doesn't have to be across all five areas um so yeah just have a think what what where you would like to start is it knowing your carbon footprint is it you know um being able to you know give that extra day of or you know of, of, of for people's birthdays or however it is that just you know baby steps um i definitely think is the key um just remind me what change. the five areas were so we've got governance mm -hmm. um uh workers which is employees plus freelancers um community which is where your suppliers sit mm -hmm. um environment and customers um, and so yeah it's about your business operations um and how you can improve that impact of, of everything. Um, so I definitely would look to maybe just have a quick ethical risk analysis, just mm. you know, of, of what you're doing. Um, and with that, but enjoy it as well. Yeah, would that be the impact assessment or? So there's the impact assessment, although our ethical, you know, again, looking at the different, you know, those, yeah. those 10 principles of the UN, um, mm. you know, you can get some good, you know, some good ideas on, on how ethical your practices are um Great. but yeah but so all along i would i would try and enjoy it you know it it, it as i say i i've i've not left a company um having worked with them that hasn't just i don't know looked shinier happier or proactive Excellent. um so <laughs> Um, and even and a lot of them are already doing and most of the time people are doing really good things they just haven't captured it all in one place to sort of be able to share all the good they're doing so yeah I'd just brilliant. say great thank you so much for your time today Joe. it's been a really brilliant conversation thank you yeah thanks for having me Polly thanks.